Welcome. Um, so let's try this out. Did we try? Did you try it yet, Cody? Tried you tried it. Try it. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Are you guys ready? I know Pam's gonna be with me. Okay. Christ is risen. He is risen. Yes, thank you. So that is a declaration that Christians have been making for 2,000 years as people have come to know the Lord and have, 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 have the church has gathered. Um, that is one of the greetings the church used to use. We talked about that this morning at 6 a.m. Some of you weren't there. Some of you were there and you went home and you took a nap. Jamie, you did go home and take a nap? Nope, he's been up. He's been drinking coffee ever since uh, about 5.30 this morning. He is wired. But nonetheless, we, that is a declaration of our faith in Christ Jesus, that he is risen, and we confirm that with, yes, he is risen indeed. Today we're going to be talking about Easter on Easter Sunday of all days, right? But today we're talking about the risen Lord and that we gather today to celebrate the risen Lord. And amen to that and praise the Lord that we get to do that today, right? So... What I want to do is I want to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, you're going to find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 a statement that Paul makes starting off in verse 3. Paul is talking to uh, this, this 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the, kind of the point of this chapter uh, in, in the book of Corinthians is to defend the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some people had came in and questioned whether the resurrection of Christ is actually legitimate and really true. Did it did it really happen? And so Paul is, is spending this chapter to def, uh, defending the cross of Christ, defending the resurrection of Jesus, and, and uh, to, to kind of talk about the weight of the, cro of the resurrection and the, why it's so essential for our faith. And he starts it off in verse 3. He says, For I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received. So what follows is what we believe to be one of the first uh, confessions of faith. So a confession of faith is a, a church, like a church-wide, not, not just like this church, but, it, but a church-wide kind of agreement that we believe a certain thing. And we, we have confessions, all kinds of confessions um, that, that have been uh, have been part of the church history um, of the church that we are a part of the Christian church we're a part of. So this we believe is one of those first confessions. And so Paul goes into it like this. He says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in according with the scripture and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. We believe this is one of the first confessions of faith where Paul would say, this is what I delivered to you and this is what I received. So I'm just giving you what I also received. And this is a core, this is the core of the Christian faith, that Jesus Christ was was born, that he died, that, that, that he rose from the grave, and that when he rose from the grave, he revealed himself uh, to first to Cephas, and then as it says, to more than 500 brothers at one time. Some, at this point that he was writing this, some you could walk up and talk to even, even at that point. Some that were still alive, some that had still had 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 lived and had saw the 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 the, the hands and the feet of Jesus with the holes from the nails and the, and the pierced side of Jesus. And so at that point, what Paul is saying, he's saying this is a confession that, we, that I heard. This is what I told you guys. This is, and we believe the resurrection to be true. And you know what? I believe this. If I asked you guys today, do you believe this confession of faith? I, I assume, and this is an assumption, I get that. Assumptions can kind of get you in trouble sometimes. But I assume most people in this room would affirm that doctrine. It would affirm that uh, affirmation of faith. And they would say, yes, absolutely, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe he rose from the grave. I believe all of this is legitimate. I, I, I believe that. There's other in your room, that, there's, there's probably other people in the room that say, you know what, I'm still on the fence. I'm not sure I really believe that. And that's kind of why I'm here today. I'm, I'm interested in what you have to say about it today. I'm interested in what the church has to say. I'm, I'm interested to come here today so I can hear what your perspective is. That's why you go to church, right? To hear more about Jesus. And so I'm here to hear that. Now, there's other people that came today. And the reason you came today is to appease a spouse. 
The reason you came today is because a neighbor or a coworker have been pestering you for months to come to their church and to join them for worship. You thought, well, Easter would be a good time. Or some of you, your grandma or your mom are going to call you a little bit later on the day and they're going to ask, did you go to church today? And you're going to say, yeah, yeah, I, I went to church. And you're going to be able to answer with an affirmative, right? And so, but when you're asked that question, do you really believe this to be true? You're going to say, probably not. No, I don't think it's true. And that's, that's, that's true. I mean, that, that is where we're at today. But I want to tell you guys, my goal in this today is not to convince you and to spend the next 30 to 45 minutes convincing you that the, the, the resurrection of Christ actually happened. That's not my goal. My goal, rather, is to ask you today if you believe, because I believe the majority of the people in this room, because of where we live and where you've grown up and, and your story has probably intersected at some point with Jesus and with the church, I believe most of us would affirm that statement that Jesus Christ is, has been resurrected. And so for that purpose, I want to ask you guys today, if we believe Jesus was resurrected from the grave and is alive today at the right hand of God the Father, what implication does that have on your life? How does that change your life? And that's what I want us to ponder together today. So if you want to open to, uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 15, we're going to just kind of walk our way through that chapter. I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but I'm going to just kind of go through it as we uh, kind, of, or kind of follow along uh, and point out some passages in that. So if you guys want to pray with me as we open, uh, and, uh, and then we'll tackle this passage. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us here today, God. We're all here for different reasons. We're all here for different purposes, God. And I don't know where there where people in this room, where their hearts are at, God, but you know where their heart is, God. And you know where they are in this journey of faith, God. And some, God, I, I believe, God, have, have trusted in you. And, 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 I, and I pray, God, that today we would, um, God, be enriched in our understanding of who you are. God, I know some in this room are searching, God, and we're, they're maybe considering you. And God, I pray that maybe this, this moment in time would move them closer to giving them giving their hearts and their lives to you God and I pray God for those that are just showing up because mom is going to ask them later or because their wife uh, to appease the wife or to appease the husband or whatever it might be God I pray um, God that you would move in their hearts and God that you would lead us all closer to you today God and we pray praise you for this day we praise you that we can celebrate the risen, risen Lord on this day God this Easter Sunday God help us to to get closer to you today through our time. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul, like I said, Paul's defending the, the, the resurrection in this passage. That's kind of his, his focal point, his focal message. His, his, his push is to defend the message of, of the resurrection and, and that Jesus rose from the grave. And so he starts off in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? See, there's a hinge point here. Paul is talking about the resurrection of the dead, meaning that if Jesus... It, it, there's a promise in the Old Testament and then in, 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 in the belief amongst Jewish people that followed into the Christian tradition that when, when you die, that that's not the end, that one day you'll be raised. And so he says their people are doubting whether that resurrection can even happen. Not only do they doubt the resurrection of people, but they resurrect, can, can God even resurrect Jesus himself? And so he is countering that opinion. And so he says in verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then even Christ has not been raised. Verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So if Christ has not been raised, then what I'm doing right now is absolute vanity. It's pointless. It has no meaning and purpose. It's kind of stupid, really, that I'm even doing this. If that's not true, he goes on to say in verse 15, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're, you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope, in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. 
I believe that we can find three implications. There's a lot more implications to uh, the, the resurrection of Jesus that, that are come out of the resurrection of Jesus. There are a lot more implications, but there, I believe that we can find three in this passage. Um, not just the one that I just read, but as we keep going in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. The first thing we, can, we find, the first implication we see, we can find it in verse 17 of this passage. Verse 17 says this, again, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're, you are still in your sins. If Christ has not been raised, then you are still in your sins, is what he's saying. And the faith that you have, it's, it's worthless. It's meaningless. See, what Paul is doing here is he's resting all of our justification and salvation. Justification meaning getting right with God. So if you are, are you're right with God, it means that you are justified, right? So if you, if you get a, I've talked about this in our Galatians series, if you get a ticket while driving out of church today, God forbid that happens. You should, I mean, where it's Easter Sunday for, I mean, you don't speed. I'm just joking. But um, kind of joking, but I mean, seriously, like we don't need speed. I need to tell myself that. But, but the, uh, the, the point is, if you get a ticket, the payment for that fine, if you go to the, the courthouse and you pay that fine, you're justified before the court. And so our justification, the forgiveness of our sins, is he rests that justification and our salvation, so the receiving the salvation from the wrath of God for our sinfulness is based, is resting on the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Because he says, if you, if you, if the Christ has not been risen from the grave, then you have not received forgiveness of your sins. You, you, your sin, you're still in your sin. Let me, this kind of requires us to kind of look at some theological ideas here. So first off, let me, when we think it helps us, we need to help to define sin real quick. See, when we think of sin, oftentimes we think of sin in terms of our thoughts and our words and our actions. So it's what we say, what we do, or what we think. That's where we kind of focus sin. And those are true. Like I, when, I, when I lie or when I think something that is not God, like that is a sinful action. But sin goes much deeper than that. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, it says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. So he defines, the Apostle John defines sin as lawlessness, living outside of authority, right? Living outside of a supreme authority. And this is, this is important for us to understand. Sin is a condition of our hearts that turns from God to ourselves. We turn away from God and his ways and we turn to our own ways. We become the own, our own authority in our lives. We choose to reject his authority and accept our own authority, right? And so then Romans chapter 6 verse 23 kind of gives us a picture of what this means for us. Because if you are in your sins, if you, have, if you have turned away from the authority of God in your life and you are pursuing your own authority that says the wages of sin is death. So the penalty for someone who is in their sin is death. Now, the Bible doesn't define death as like perishing and like not existing anymore. Rather, the Bible defines death as an eternal separation from God in hell, where you go to a place of torment, where you go to a place where the justice of God is poured out in his wrath on sin. And so that is when we, when we, when we turn from the authority of God and we go towards our own authority, we're in sin and sin leads to death, which is eternal punishment in hell. I'm not a, like a, brim, a fire and brimstone preacher, but like the Bible speaks pretty clearly on that. Like you don't really have to beat people over the head. You just read the Bible and that's what it says. You know, that, that's, that's where we're at. And so on the cross, see this is important. On the cross, the wrath of God is justly poured out on Jesus for the sins of those who trust in him. So on Friday, we did this cross. So this cross, uh, we had the cross sitting out front. If you guys weren't here on Friday, we had the cross sitting out front. And then at the end of the service, everybody came up with a hammer and a nail and they nailed their sin to the cross because that's what happened on Good Friday. Jesus was nailed to a cross. He was hung up on the, on, on the hill in Golgotha. And then he died a slow and painful death. And through that death, the sins of the world, anyone who would trust in him, were paid for on that cross. But this is important for us to understand. 
At the end of Friday night, Jesus was dead. And as we we sang about this today and, 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 and what is true in Scripture is what it looked like is sin and Satan had won. They had defeated Jesus. They had defeated Jesus through death, the greatest enemy. And so Jesus, this is important, Jesus in a tomb means that we are still in our sins. The penalty remains. And that's what's so important about the resurrection of Christ. Because if he didn't raise from the dead, then we have no hope. We're still in our sins because death has defeated the Savior. Because the penalty of sin is death, and so he didn't defeat the penalty. He may have paid for our sin, but he didn't defeat the... So we still have the penalty of sin in our lives. We, he hasn't defeated that aspect of it. But see, this is, this is, this is, why, this is why it's so important for us to understand this. Verse, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 17 through 19 says this, and I'll kind of work my way through this and talk a little bit as I, as I break it down. It says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standards of the teaching which you were committed. Gets what he says about those of us who are in our sins. That at one point we were slaves to sin. And this is the thing that doesn't that people don't register with real quick. So we think that if I am not following the ways of God, like I can choose, like I'm either going to follow the ways of God or I'm going to follow my own path. And I'm going to be my autonomous authority in my life, the supreme authority in my own life. I don't need God. I can do it myself. Now, we don't always cognitively do this. Most of the time, many of us, we, we don't cognitively say, I'm going to follow my own path. But we, by our actions and by the way we live, are following our own path. And so for that reason, we think we have autonomy, right? But in, uh, in Ephesians chapter uh, 2, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, it says this about us. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. And here it is, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. See, this is, this, is, this is the weighty reality of those who believe they live outside of the, the authority of God. Maybe you do, maybe you don't follow the authority of God, but you are under the authority of the prince of the power of the air. You are following the course of this world. You don't, have, you don't have authority over your own life. You are a slave to sin. And that slavery to sin makes you a slave to death because the end of the life, at the end of your life, you die in sin. And that death leads not to a glorious heavenly home, and see, this is the, we, at funerals, we hear this all the time at funerals, when we, you know this person didn't live a perfect life. You know they, they didn't ever trust in Jesus and give their life to Jesus and never walked with Jesus. And maybe they made a confession of faith one time, but there's no indication of that faith ever making an impact on their lives. And we say, oh, they're in a better place now. But at the end of the day, like we say that to make ourselves feel better. But is that true? And so for us today, we're, we're looking at this passage and, and it's saying that you once were slaves to sin. But now it says in verse 18, and having been set free from sin, have, have become slaves of righteousness. See, there's a change, a different path that we go down when we come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior of our life. He says, I am speaking, and he says, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. He's saying, I'm talking to you about the slaves of righteousness. And slave. It's basically what's the authority of your life? Either the authority of your life is sin or the authority of your life is the righteousness or Jesus. That's the only two options. He says, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. The word sanctification means that we start to look more and more and more like Jesus in the way we act, in the way we relate to others, in the way we live, in the way we, we, we work and, and do everything that we do. we living living as Jesus would have us to live. And so he's saying, we once presented our members our, our body 
as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. But now that we have been freed from the power of sin in our lives, freed from the power of, of death and hell in our lives, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. See, when Jesus breathed his first resurrected breath, the chains of sin that lead to death were broken for all those who would trust in Jesus. Let me give you some, some a word picture here or, or a picture in your mind. See, when Jesus was in that grave on Friday and Saturday, his body did not have any blood flow. It didn't have any, the lungs weren't pumping. The brain had no action and no activity going on. Jesus was literally dead and decaying in the grave. But then at some point on Sunday morning, God intervened and his heart began to pump and his lungs began to breathe air. His brain began to function. And the minute life entered Jesus, the minute life came back into him, the bonds of sin and the slavery to death began to be broken, were instantly broken, not began to be broken. I need to make sure my language is right. For anyone who would trust in Jesus. See, Jesus has liberated us from the slavery and the bondage of sin and death. Romans 6, 4 says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. See, this is the implication. If you, if you are no longer a slave to sin, if you have trusted in Jesus and have now no longer a slave to sin and death in your life, how is your life different? How has it changed? How can you come continue to live in your, in your sins if you've died to your sins? If you've died to sin, how can you continue to live in it? Romans 6, 11 through 12 says this, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. See, I intentionally, one of my intent, I intentionally limit using the word saved when I'm referring to someone's conversion. So when someone, I, when I ask someone, I typically don't say, hey, is that person saved? Or did they get, when did they get, I usually, I usually say something to the effect of when did they trust in Christ? When did they give their life to Jesus or whatever it is? Because I want to express something because what, what using the word saved, and I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty for using the word saved or anything like that. That's just kind of a cultural term we talk about, but what it sends the message oftentimes is that what has happened in, uh, is, and what has happened for us is in a one-time exchange, a, one, a, a moment in time, we made a decision to, 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 to accept Jesus as Lord, as, as Savior of our lives, and so he covers our sins. And so that moment, that time, that exchange in that particular moment only matters for when we die. So I got saved. I, I walked an aisle. I got saved. I prayed a prayer. I got saved. And so then we're good. But see, that only is one aspect of, 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 of the gospel. See, the gospel, yes, Jesus did die on the cross to forgive you of all of your sins so that you could spend eternity in heaven with him. But he rose from the grave to give you victory over sin and death. Amen? He didn't raise from the grave so that we can have just have a hope in heaven. That is absolutely a pot. But he rose from the grave so that your life could be different, so that you could break through the slavery of sin. And so if that's the case, if that's the case, the case, trusting in Christ, becoming a Christian, means you have died to the authority of sin and death and are now free to live for Jesus. How has your life changed? How is your life different knowing Jesus is alive? Is, is your life different? Is the ethic of your life different? Meaning the way you make decisions, the, the way you live your life, is it different because you know Jesus? Or if you look at your life, is it pursuing the passions of the flesh, the desires of the flesh? You're a slave to sin. But you have this kind of illusion that you have some kind of authority in your life. So you can make your own decisions. That God's way, that's a way, but it's not maybe the way for me. 
And I, uh, and, and you're making a mockery of the cross because if you say you accepted Jesus and, and he covered all your sins and yet you continue and remain and make a habit of that sin habitually in your life, then you are saying, well, I, I, I mean, Jesus is going to cover him in the end. But the cross and the resurrection have to be hand in hand. Jesus not only died for your sin, but he rose to conquer it in your life. Is, has sin been conquered in your life? That's our first implication. The second implication is this. Life is not in vain. The resurrection, if we believe the resurrection, then we believe life is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 21 says this. Right after, right before this, he said, Paul says this, if, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, if only, we only hope is in this life that we live, we are of all people most to be pitied. Because we're talking about the afterlife and resurrection, all that. We are to be pitied for spending all this money and all this time and doing all these things. And they're being meaningless and futile. Verse 20 says this, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as, men, as by a man came death, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. See, the promise is that one day, if you are in Christ Jesus, you will be raised from the dead, and, and Jesus Christ will reign over you in your life. You will be with him in paradise. So that being the case, what, what's being questioned here is whether or not resurrection can happen at all. And Paul's saying absolutely resurrection can happen. Jesus was raised and he was the first fruits of resurrection. And so what he's saying there is Jesus being raised from the dead means that death is no longer the end of life. It's no longer the end, right? Paul says that Jesus is the first fruits, meaning the first to be raised, but everybody will follow in being raised from the dead. Verse 22 says, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. If you believe in Jesus, if you believe Jesus rose from the grave, then life does not end when you die. And so get this, our hope is not wrapped up in what we can accomplish on this world, in this world, in this life. Our hope is not wrapped up in what can, we can accumulate in this life. And for my millennial friends out there, my age group, our hope is not wrapped up in what we can experience in this life. And we all, I mean, I, I'm not saying that it's just a, but generationally, I would say us, us millennials, we, we just desire to experience life. We want to experience food and we want to experience uh, uh, events and concerts and music and travel and, 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 and entertainment and all the things of life. We want to enjoy life while we have it, right? And that's, I mean, that's true of other generations as well. I think my, my parents' generation, it was about accumulation, Hope was in accumulating and saving and retiring and having things and, and looking at the, the, how big our boat was and how big our house was and how big our cars were and maybe our smaller cars were because the sports cars are kind of small, right? How much money we have in our checking account and our savings account and our retirement account and accumulation of stuff and our hope is built on accumulating more and more stuff. In 1 Corinthians 15.32, Paul quotes um, uh, the Solomon, the king, uh, David's son. He says something about the beasts of Ephesus, and I'll, I'll talk about that another day. But he says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, eat and drink, for tomorrow we will die. See, Solomon in Ecclesiastes 8.15 says this, I, and I commend you, I commend joy. For man has nothing better under the sun. When he says under the sun, he means everything in this world, okay, in this life. Not, man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. So he says all you've got is to eat, drink, and be merry if it ends all here. But see... If there is no future beyond this world, then this world, we need to plunder everything we can get from this world. We need to live as if this is all we, can, we, we have, and so we need to eat, and we need to drink, and be married. Why are you working a job unless it has something to do with you getting more stuff, or having more stuff, or having more experiences, or whatever it may be? And you see our culture living this, thing, living this out, that I've got to get everything I can get from this world, because when this world's over, there's nothing else for me. 
And the resurrection of Christ speaks directly against that, right? Solomon even says, Solomon has access to all that life has to offer. He's the wealthiest and most powerful man that has ever existed. He had all the wealth, the power, the possessions, the sex, the experience, the whatever he wanted it, whenever he wanted it. And yet he says in the book of Ecclesiastes, it's all vain. It's all vanity. He spends much of the book of Ecclesiastes pointing out the vanity of putting our hope in the things of this world that are going to ultimately go away. We spend our life accumulating stuff only to die and never be able to bring any of it with us. We spend our lives trying to, to soak up everything we can from this world, and, and yet at the end of the life, we, at the end of our lives, we have very little, all we have to show for it is the memories that we have, right? But if, there, if, this, if this thing about Jesus being risen from the grave is true, then we've got our, our focus all off, right? 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. If you believe Jesus is raised from the dead, your life is more than eating and drinking and being merry. See, we have been given a living hope, and his name is Jesus. We've been given a living hope, and his name is Jesus. Amen? And in Christ Jesus, we have a hope of an inglorious inheritance. I was reading a book um, by Jerry Bridges, one of my favorite authors, called The Gospel for Real Life, and he shares a story. I don't know if it's a true story, but it's a great story nonetheless. It doesn't really matter if it's true. Probably is. Pastor stories are mostly true, right, Andy? It says, a southern plantation owner left a $50,000 inheritance for a former slave who had served him faithfully all of his life. That was quite a sum of money in those days, perhaps equivalent to a half a million dollars today. The lawyer for the estate duly notified the old man of his inheritance and told him that the money had been deposited for him in a local bank. Weeks went by. And the former slave never called for any of his inheritance. Finally, the banker called him, called him in and told him again that he had $50,000 available to draw on at any time. The old man replied, Sir, do you think I could have 50 cents to buy a sack of cornmeal? Not having handled money most of his life, the former slave had no comprehension of his wealth. As a result, he was asking for 50 cents when he could easily have had much, much more. Bridges goes on to say this. This is what the gospel is all about. Jesus paid our debt, our sin debt to the full. But he did, not, he did far more than relieve us of debt. He also purchased for us an eternal inheritance worth infinitely, infinitely more than the $50,000 the ex-slave has inherited. That's why Paul wrote of the unsearchable riches of Christ. And God wants us to enjoy those unsearchable riches in the here and the now, even in the midst of the difficult and discouraging circumstances of our lives. See this, how has, the, how has Jesus raising from the dead changed your life? If you believe it, you are promised the greatest inheritance anybody could ever imagine. You are promised not only salvation from your sin, you're promised a great inheritance. And that inheritance is not something you just enjoy when life comes to an end, but rather, if, you, if I told you right now your uncle, your rich uncle is going to pass away and next week you're going to get a million dollars, how would that change your life this week? It would change your, I don't care what you say, it would change your life. I'd go buy a truck, like right away. Like, I'm okay, I'm going to buy a truck. I'm putting it on credit because next week I'm going to be able to pay it all off, right? Like, you'd change your life. And if you've trusted in Jesus, and if you believe the resurrection is true, you are promised a great inheritance. But how has it changed your life? Are you still soaking up everything you can get from this world? Then you're not living under this, this hope of the inheritance that you will receive in heaven. The last and possibly most important implication of the resurrection of Jesus, if we believe it to be true, is that Jesus is the ultimate authority in all things. Look at verse 24 of chapter 15. 
Then comes the end when, when he delivers, when Jesus delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be, to be, to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet, under the feet of Jesus. See, this, this verse 24 kind of gives us a glimpse of, of the end times, when Jesus will deliver the kingdom of God to the Father. And just a real quick understanding how the Trinity works. God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're co-equal in their existence, meaning that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all three God. They exist as in the characteristics of, of God and attributes of God. They all possess them equally, and they are equally God. Yet, they function in a subordinate sort of way. So God the Father is the planner and the, and the author of all creation and everything. And so he puts things into motion. And the Son, Jesus, is the working out of things uh, in the earth. And so in, first, in John chapter 1, we see that Jesus is the hands of creation. He is literally who created the heavens and the earth. Nothing exists outside of Jesus because he actually made things happen, right? And then the Spirit of God is the presence of God. And in the creation, he was the presence of God hovering over the waters. And in the church and salvation, he is the presence of God that enters into us when we become Christians, when we trust in Jesus. He enters into us. He is God's presence in us. And so the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equally God, yet they are, are subordinate to one another. So when he says that he hand, hands over the, the kingdom to God the Father, it's in this subordination sort of way. But it's important for us to understand that Jesus is, at this point in human history, at this point in history, Verse 25, it says, For he must reign until he has put all the enemies under his feet. And right before that, he says, After destroying every rule and every authority and every power. See, Jesus, his duty is to put all his enemies under his feet. The last being death. Now, when it says the last being death, it doesn't mean that the last one will be death, but the most important and the, and the, and the worst any of all is death. And so when Jesus rose from the grave, he defeated the greatest enemy, his greatest enemy, death. Our greatest enemy is death. And the resurrection of, of Jesus was the inauguration of him as king. And God the Father has named him king over all things. What's, why is this significant for us? Why is this significant for you? It means that we don't live in a world that is outside of his authority. Jesus represents this in all of his miracles. See, Jesus, when his miracles are not like David Blaine magic tricks where he's levitating and like making cars disappear and, and trying to show people how cool he is, Jesus' miracles point to his authority. He has authority to calm storms. He has authority to heal the sickness uh, in people. He has authority to raise people from the dead. And he has authority to say death has no longer has a sting on us. The resurrection of Christ is his inauguration as king. That Jesus is over all things and he will rule over every authority and power in this world. So it means that you don't live in a world that's outside of his authority. See, there's things in our world that we feel like are out of our control. But what we can know based on the resurrection is nothing is out of his control. The second thing is it means that no force inside or outside of us... There is no force inside or outside of us that's outside of his control. That means that there may be something that we are, we're saying that this, you know, I, I, my, my, my sickness or death or, or pain or law, whatever it is, is outside addiction. Whatever it is, is outside of my control. Nothing is outside of God's control. Well, last thing it means is this. It means that your life and my life is not outside of his authority. I quote this, uh, well, I talk about this passage a lot. In Philippians chapter 2, it says that at the, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And what he's saying there is every knee that's ever existed, every person that's ever existed will one day bow to Jesus as the Lord of their life. Rather, whether, they, 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 whether they've followed him or not, whether they've trusted him or not, every knee will bow. See, this is the thing, the important thing for us to understand. We don't make Jesus Lord of our life. He is Lord of our life. It's whether or not we acknowledge it or not. Do you guys get that? It's not, it's not like, okay, I'm ready to make Jesus the Lord. He is already the Lord of your life. Are you ready to acknowledge him as Lord of your life? Romans chapter 9, or chapter 10, verses 9 
and 10. I share this passage every, almost every week because I believe it's, this is our call. This is our response. It says this, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I want to just just talk about that passage real quick because I think it under, it, we, we, in order for us to understand that, it's essential for us to understand what this passage is saying. But there's two parts to this passage. And I want to break them down. I want to start with, a, with, the first, or with the last first. Here we go. If that, that, that's cool with you guys. So it says, if you're truly saved, you're truly going to be saved, you're truly going to be a, a follower of Christ, you must believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And like I said to start off, most people in this room would check that box and say, yeah, I, I believe that. I believe Jesus was raised from the dead. I, I mean, I'm good with that. And this is the reality. You, you would be in the same place as Satan and the demons. Let me use some logic from James 2.19. It says, you believe that God is one and you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. If, if Satan, if, if the devil was here today himself, and I was able to interview the devil, if I asked him this question, do you believe that the Bible is the word of God? He would say absolutely yes. If I asked him, do you believe Jesus is the son of God? And he would say absolutely yes. Sure I do. Do you believe Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave? He would say yes, I believe that. Do you believe that he is the only way to be saved? The devil would say yes, I believe that. And if I asked him, are you willing to commit to living a good moral life, being involved in church and maybe even leading in church, he would respond with a yes, to even to that question. So where's the dividing line? The dividing line comes in the first part of that verse. If you're going to be saved, we're truly going to walk with Jesus. We're truly going to have a relationship with Jesus. You must confess him with your mouth as Lord. If I ask the devil today, if you believe all these things to be true about Christ, will you confess today that he is the Lord of your life? His answer would be absolutely not. And for many of us in this room today, we check the first box, but we don't check the second one. Maybe you would say you've checked the second one. Maybe you would say, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I believe that. I, I, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. He's the Lord of my life, sure. But I shared a quote with you guys last week from, from my, one of my favorite authors, Jeff Vanderstelt. He says this, everything that we are and do is a result of what we believe. Our behaviors are the tangible expressions of our belief. See, the reality is many of us would, would check both boxes, but our life does not show that we check both boxes. See, the resurrection of Jesus allows or, 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 or inaugurates Jesus as the king of your life. But the reality is we may believe that he was raised from the dead, but we have not made him Lord of our lives. We have not acknowledged him as Lord of our lives. There's a condition of the heart when we have truly done this. There's a condition of the heart that says, yes, I believe Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave. And he is Lord. And he is Lord of my life. He is Lord, not my job, not my career, not my family, not my girlfriend, not my boyfriend. Not my stuff, not my house, not my possessions. Nothing else. He and he only is Lord of my life. Maybe, maybe you, do, you do believe that Jesus rose from the, from, the gra from the grave and praise God that you've gotten to that point. But how has that changed your belief? How's, how's that belief changed you? How's that belief changed your life? Do you live in the freedom from sin and death? Do you live with, with this hope in heaven that changes your life here and now? Do you live as if Jesus is the Lord and the authority in your life? See, this is the reality. When Jesus took his first resurrected breath 2,000 years ago, it changed everything. And this world and the universe that we live in and the spiritual realm, everything changed. But the reality for you is this. If you believe Jesus rose from the grave, then your only right response is to give him yourself as the Lord of your life. It's not enough just to walk an aisle, pray a prayer. 
We have to give him full reign and authority over our lives. So I don't know where everybody stands today, but the call is the same every week. It doesn't matter if it's Easter Sunday or if it's the middle of the year or whatever it is. The call is always the same. If you've never trusted in Jesus, then it's time to give your life to him. And maybe you think, man, I, I walked an aisle one time, but man, I, I, my life hasn't changed. I'm not different because of Jesus. Well, today is the opportunity for you to, to begin that process of changing, to put him in the rightful seat of authority in your life, the king of your life. I'm going to pray the band's going to come forward and we're going to have an opportunity to respond, however God may be leading you to respond. And if you need to make a confession of faith today, I pray that you would do that. You can do that in your seat. You can come forward and talk to me. Um, if I'm tied up, Andy's here as well. We'd love to, to chat with you today or come by my office sometime this week and let's talk. So if you guys will bow your heads, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I am. Um, God, thank you. God, thank you that you have brought us here today from in a variety of different places in life. God, you've brought us here today. And God, I pray that, God, if you are, are your spirit is working on hearts, God, today, Father, that they, their, their, their hearts are, are, are growing towards you, Father, that you're pursuing hearts today. God, I pray that, some, that, that anyone, someone in this room would trust you as Lord today, God. And God, that they would confess their sins to you. They would confess that they are a sinner and that their sin, the only just payment of their sin is death, God. And if they are in their sin, that their death will be the payment, God. But if they trust in you, that the payment has been paid on the cross through Christ Jesus and his resurrection. And I pray that they would trust you and I pray that they would turn from their sins and begin to follow and walk with you. God, for, for those of us who have trusted in you, God, I pray that we would continually every day wake up and, 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 and acknowledge you as the Lord of our lives, the authority in our lives. God, we would live under those implications of the resurrection, that because the resurrection is true, we have conquered sin and death, that there is a hope for eternity and that you are the Lord of our lives. God, help us leave this place today with that as our hope and as our, our call. We ask all this in Jesus' name.